Hello everyone. Uh, today, James Friedrichs from Georgetown University is going to give us a uh, talk title Strategies for Quantum Chemistry on Quantum Computers. Uh, you can start, James. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to, to speak here. Um, I want to just say a couple of things. Please feel free to interrupt me at any time if you want more clarification on something that I'm saying. And then the second thing uh, for the organizers, uh, please feel free to stop me. I actually have packed a lot in here. I'm not sure I can actually get through it all in the time that we have. So uh, if I am running long and I'm not noticing the time, please interrupt me so I can, uh, I can bring it to a close. Um, I'm going to be telling you about some different strategies for uh, looking at quantum chemistry on a quantum computer. And this is work that I've done uh, with a number of different people on a range of different uh, uh, projects. I've listed all their names here, and you'll see them again at the end of the talk. And uh, this work has been funded uh, in part by uh, Department of Energy and in part by National Science Foundation. All right, so uh, the main goal that we have is to figure out how to cross this chasm to make chemistry practical on a quantum computer. Current molecules that have been looked at on quantum computers are things that you could almost solve uh, by hand with uh, pencil and paper. And we want to get to the point where the quantum computers are really uh, becoming competitive with what can be done with classical computers. And in many respects, and for some reason this isn't working, I wonder why. Uh, just give me one second. Let me also do this. Hopefully now it's going to work. Okay. So I, I love this image. Uh, this is kind of the current state of quantum computing. We're on that bottom step, and we're trying to climb this very big uh, set of steps, which when you're a one-and-a-half or two-year-old, it looks pretty ominous to, to be able to get up to the top. Um, so as I had was mentioning this. You can think of this as kind of like the ENIAC days of classical computing. At least it's analogous to that, uh, in that we haven't figured out yet exactly uh, what technology is going to be the winner. Um, back in the ENIAC days, uh, there was no idea that we were going to have the semiconductor industry uh, creating computers on a very different scale from what the original computers were. Uh, right now, what we have are what are termed noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. That's a term that comes from John Preskill. And here's images of uh, IBM. And uh, um, it's not really the INQ computer. This is really the experimental lab of Chris Monroe. Uh, but that's what the INQ computer is based off of. And one of the methods for solving quantum chemistry is the variational quantum eigensolver. And this was introduced uh, seven years ago now. Uh, in this uh, uh, famous paper in Nature Communications. And the way that this works is that you're using the quantum computer to prepare a state, and then you're going to measure properties of that state. And the properties you're going to measure of that state, if you do it correctly, will ultimately end up giving you expectation values of the Hamiltonian in that state. But you're going to be reading off all of that data after all the different measurements and putting them into a classical machine that is going to tell you ultimately what the final expectation value is for the energy. And then you could also measure other quantities, like how that energy is changing when you change a parameter in the state that you prepared. And then take all of that information and try to determine what is a update to the parameters and what is the new state that you want to prepare that will give you a better energy than the state that you started from. And so it has this both a uh, quantum aspect, which involves the state preparation and the um, measuring of the properties of the state. And then it has the classical aspect, which is accumulating all of the results and then doing an optimization to tell you what the next wave function is that you should put on the quantum computer. And one of the strategies for doing this is a technique called coupled cluster. This has an old history. It actually started in nuclear physics with uh, Fred Coaster and Herbert Kummel. Uh, but it really grew in chemistry in the 1960s with the, uh, I'm not sure I can pronounce this right, but it's probably something like Yuri uh, Chizek and Josef Paldus uh, in the chemistry field. And it is now viewed as the gold standard for doing calculations on 
weakly correlated molecules in chemistry. Uh, the challenge is coupled cluster is not unitary, and quantum computers really only work primarily with unitary operators. We do now have resets, and I'll be talking a little bit about that later in the talk. But most of the operations you're going to be doing on a quantum computer are going to involve uh, resets. Um, Werner uh, Kutzelnig and others proposed a unitary variant where you take the operator e to the t, which would be the, uh, um, perhaps we can mute if we're not uh, uh, asking a question. Um, uh, e to the t, and uh, you subtract the Hermitian conjugate in the exponent. And then that becomes a unitary operator, because if you take the Hermitian conjugate of that, it goes to e to the minus t plus uh, e to the minus, uh, minus t plus t dagger. And that's obviously the inverse of e to the t minus t dagger. So this now has a unitary form. And this is something that you can then apply on a quantum computer. One of the ways that you can do this is in what we call a factorized form. Um, the exact form where you put all of those operators in one exponential is not something that we have any quantum circuits to evaluate. So one of the ways to do it is to trotterize that product using some steps that are determined by the amplitudes that you put in front of each of those factors. Um, but you can instead just think about doing a factorized form where you just put each of the individual terms and the factors uh, in a string together to create your variational uh, wave function. Uh, when you do it in that factorized form, it's not unique because the ordering of the factors matters. But the variational principle in general gives you enough freedom that if you pick a reasonable ordering, uh, you should be able to get a good energy. And uh, it's important to remember that in chemistry, we're not trying to get the exact energy. We're trying to get an energy that is accurate enough, uh, the so-called chemical accuracy, so that we can do something useful with the calculation. So this idea has been uh, carried out now a few years ago uh, at INQ with the minimal basis for water. They were able to apply up to three different UCC factors, and that's given by this experimental data in orange here. And what they showed is if you could get up to about 20 factors or so, you would be able to start becoming competitive with the uh, exact result, the full CI calculation, which is this blue line. Now, I should caution you, uh, this would be an incredibly poor approximation for water because it's well known in water that the minimal basis, which is what's being used here, is a atrociously bad approximation to the uh, energies of the water molecule. And we'll give you, a, uh, I'll be presenting some results that do a bit better than this. Um, but this is really one of the things that you have to keep in mind. If you want to be competitive with classical computer calculations, you can't be doing things in a minimal basis. You're going to have to go beyond a minimal basis and be able to uh, incorporate lots of different terms. So their claim is that they could get to almost chemical accuracy. And the circuits that they use were fairly efficient. They were uh, um, really made to work particularly with the um, hardware uh, that they were running on. So they're using these XX phase gates. Um, but it also brings to mind a question, which is when we're doing this kind of a VQE problem, are we simply exchanging the hard quantum problem which is challenging to do with a hard noisy optimization problem that we're putting onto the classical computer. Because it's not known how to optimize thousands or hundreds of thousands of noisy uh, um, of uh, uh, parameters with noisy data in an efficient way on a classical computer. And that's essentially what you have to do be in order to do these uh, quantum chemistry calculations at scale, or, or bigger. I mean, there's some quantum chemistry calculations that I think have used uh, hundreds of millions, if not more, amplitudes. There also are some extra subtleties of UCC. There's this very nice paper by Evangelista Chan and Scuzeria, which talks about um, different aspects about uh, the factorized form of the uh, unitary coupled cluster theory. Um, but one aspect I want to show you, just an example, that there, even if there are some uh, constraints, there's also a lot of flexibility with the approach is we're going to apply the unitary coupled cluster approximation to the Hubbard model. And if you are a chemist, you probably don't know what a Hubbard model is. If you're a physicist, you're probably quite familiar with it. We have electrons on, lattice, on a lattice, which has been indicated with these up and down arrows. 
and there's a hopping indicated by this minus t that carries electrons from one site to the neighboring site. And then if two electrons of opposite spin are on the same site, we pay an energy cost of u. And the problem that we looked at was a four-site Hubbard model. And we're working, going to actually look at the problem in momentum space. So in momentum space, you have these four different energy levels. There's a degeneracy. Uh, level one and level three are degenerate. This is the uh, energy level at the zone center. This is at the zone boundary. And this is in the middle of the Brewan zone. So the Hubbard model written in terms of these operators in momentum space, it's diagonal in the kinetic energy, but the potential energy is complicated and has lots of different terms in it. The ground state looks like this, where, let me just make sure you're clear on what this notation is. This notation for this particular state says, I have an upspin in this state zero, I have an upspin in this state one, I have a downspin in this state zero, and I have a downspin in this state three. So that is one of the states that is a degenerate lowest energy state uh, when u is equal to zero. But when u is non-zero, the state can actually be written in this form. And the symmetry means that these two coefficients are exactly the same. This is a beta, and then some of the coefficients are the same. Some of them have factors of minus two in front of them. And then there's a third set of terms that has a coefficient gamma. <coughs> and these coefficients alpha, beta, gamma are not independent because alpha squared plus beta squared plus gamma squared um, multiplied by some numbers has to equal one because this is going to be a normalized wave function. So the momentum space is the natural orbital basis and it turns out that we can actually construct the, this exact ground state wave function uh, using coupled cluster that just involves doubles and quads. And I'm going to go through you how to do that. But first I want to tell you about an operator identity that you get for uh, the factorized form of a unitary coupled cluster uh, term that you're going to be applying to the Hamiltonian. So the coupled cluster terms have this form where I these are the terms that are acting on the real orbitals. They are removing electrons from what is typically the Hartree-Fox state, and then they're placing those electrons in other orbitals, which are labeled by these ABCs, to make it unitary, in this case, because I've included a factor of I in here, and I've added a factor of I here, <coughs> it becomes the sum of the, of the uh, A operator plus its Hermitian conjugate. But the key is if you take this operator here in the exponent and you square it, it actually becomes a projection operator, which is this operator here, which means if I cube it, I get this operator again. And uh, that allows us to actually sum the series because the, uh, the first term is an exception, but after the first term, all odd terms have an operator, have exactly this operator multiplying it, and all even terms after the first term have this term multiplying it. And so you can recognize that you get a sine series and a cosine series, and you actually get this exact identity for this operator. Now, this actually brings up a way in which you can work with these factorized factors, also on a quantum computer, but we haven't done that. Um, but you can actually, because this is a unitary operator, and because you have this simple expression as a sum over, um, a sum over operators, and these are uh, Pauli these can be decomposed into sums of Pauli strings, uh, as can these. Um, you actually have a sum over unitaries. And so you can use the linear combination of unitaries technique once the select operation becomes available to actually um, uh, calculate the UCC factor on a quantum computer um, exactly with no approximation. Um, so the way in which we're going to be now doing uh, this is we're going to go through the different steps to get you to the final uh, wave function. I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly because um, it's kind of technical and uh, it's not that uh, useful to look at all of the different uh, terms one by one as we build them together. But here's one UCC factor, and because it can excite the Hartree-Fox state, the first term ends up being a cosine times the state I started with, which is the Hartree-Fox state. And then I'm minus sine times the excited state, which in this case has uh, removed these two particles and put them in this upper energy level. And now when I apply a second double, I get two of the terms that I want. So I have, you know, I have 
I'm going to get an extra factor of cosine times this term. This is a term that isn't changed. That's the Hartree-Fock. I'm going to get a cosine times this term because this term isn't changed by this excitation operator. And then I'm going to get a minus sign when it acts on this term. And I'm going to get a minus sign when it acts on this term. And the problem is this term is actually not a term that has the correct coefficient. So we actually have to get rid of this term from our expansion. And the way in which we do that is we have to actually apply a quad to get rid of that because we want to make sure we do not screw up these coefficients here, which are correct in the way that we want them, but we just need to get rid of this guy. So we have to use a quad to get rid of that. And this operator just involves the Hartree-Fox state and the term that we want to get rid of. And, and the coefficient is determined precisely by what that coefficient is in front of it. And from that, we can then remove that term that was the bad term that we wanted to get rid of. And then after that, all of the other terms that we apply as doubles, we do it in a specific way where they don't interfere with other terms. So we need no more quads for any of these extra terms that we're going to be adding. And there's a number of them that we have to add. And I'm going to just kind of show you what it looks like. I'm not going to really go through and talk you through all these different terms. Uh, this is uh, one of the doubles factors that we need to add. And then there's a fifth one, and there's a sixth one, and there's a seventh one, and then I think this is the last one, an eighth one. And now this actually now includes all of the terms in the form of that ground state that I was showing you. And all we have to do is determine what the angles are in order to give us the right coefficients. Oops, I guess there was one more, sorry. Um, and now we have to actually determine the angles to give us those coefficients. And this is the formula for those angles in terms of those initial values, the beta, um, the alpha, and the gamma. And this is what they look like as a function of u. This theta 2, that's the coefficient of the quad term. So when the u is small, I don't really need it because it's very close to 0. But as the system becomes more and more strongly correlated, I definitely need it. And if we look at these angles as a function of u, particularly in the large u limit, you can see one of the angles is approaching pi over 4. And all the other angles are less than pi over 8. And this is something that is sort of generic that happens with the UCC approximation to a wave function. Many of the angles don't get very large in the wave function ever, even if the correlations become very, very large. And that's an important point I'd like you to keep in your head as I go through the, uh, more of the talk. OK, so what I've illustrated for you is that we actually can create very precise wave functions using the UCC in a factorized form. In fact, here we're, we're preparing the exact ground state. We now look at doing this as a variational calculation in chemistry, and we're applying it to the H10 molecule as a function of the stretch in the H10 molecule. And I want you to focus here on the left-hand side. This is looking at, this is a problem that can be solved with a full configuration interaction, or if you're a physicist with exact diagonalization, and that's the black curves. And the coupled cluster singles doubles does very well until about this point where it starts to fail miserably. And this is something that often happens with coupled cluster. When it gets too correlated, the coupled cluster just fails. But this unitary coupled cluster using singles and doubles, that's the blue curves. And you can see that it remains, it's always variational, and it remains very close to the full CI, even out to large stretches. And in particular here, here we're looking at what the angles are. And in a weakly correlated regi regime down here, this is a length of one bore, okay, so down here, you can see almost all of the angles are small. Even here in a strongly correlated regime, this is at 3.6 bore, so this is at this point here, there's a handful of angles that are starting to get sizable, but even here, 0.4 is not, a, this is in radians, 0.4 is not very large in size. Still, most of the angles are quite small. And um, again, that's an important point that I would like you to remember that I'm going to actually be getting into uh, momentarily. All right, so uh, what we are trying to do here is we want to trade off the circuit depth for more measurements. Because again, if we go back to this picture here, you can see I've got 800 or so singles and doubles that I'm putting into this. And this is a small system. This is a system that can be solved with full CI. It is very hard to imagine doing 800 UCC factors. The state of the art from two years ago was doing three. 
So getting to a large number of UCC factors is going to be hard on these quantum computers, even if they are fault tolerant, because even a fault tolerant computer is going to have some net coherence time. It's only going to be able to run so many operations before it's going to fail, at least in the early stages of the uh, hardware as it gets developed. So what we're trying to do is we're going to do a variational expansion of the energy as a function of these amplitudes or angles theta, and we're gonna truncate it at second order. And we're gonna find that this greatly reduces the circuit depth, but at the expense of greatly increasing the number of measurements that we have to take. And the reason why is that we're gonna be able to include many of the orbitals in a virtual way that I'm gonna to explain to you. This also has the potential to greatly reduce the optimization overhead because the optimization is actually carried out via Gaussian elimination on a, a quantum uh, on a conventional computer, and it doesn't have the same kind of issues with optimization that standard optimizers are. It's in many respects similar to what people would call Hessian-based op optimizers. The idea is that we're going to start by doing a Maclaurin expansion about theta equals zero for all of those terms, the individual UCC factors. The derivatives are all simple because it's a, each term has a theta that's in the exponent, and the derivative of an exponential is just the operator in the exponent times the exponential. But if I then set theta equals zero, the exponential goes away because it's exponential of zero. So I'm just left with the exponent. So each derivative just pulls down one of those exponents. If I take two derivatives, I'll pull down two exponents. So the, the evaluation of the derivatives of the energy as a function of the angles is actually very simple when I write the wave function in this factorized form. And then to optimize it, it's just a quadratic form. We can optimize it with Gaussian el elimination. And it turns out that the first and second derivatives can all be found from the Hamiltonian matrix expressed in the hartree fock basis. You don't even have to do a calculation. The only thing you have to do is Gaussian elimination. And you might ask, well, does it work? Well, it actually works remarkably well. I want to convince you of that near equilibrium. It, it really does well. So this is a calculation of equilibrium energies using couple cluster singles doubles. And you can see the scale here is 25 millihartries. So this is not chemical accuracy. Chemical accuracy is more like one and a half millihartries. If I do it a couple, if I go to couple clusters, singles, doubles, and include some triples, I'm getting closer in some of the cases I'm at chemical accuracy for some of the molecules. But here's this very simple one, which essentially is just calculating Hamiltonian matrix elements in the hartree fock basis and doing a Gaussian elimination. And look, this is only running up to six. We're getting almost as good accuracy as couple clusters, singles, doubles, triples. We're getting better accuracy in most cases than couple clustered singles, doubles. But also notice, sometimes the energies are negative. This is not variational. And it's not variational because we've truncated the energy expansion at quadratic order. And that means that we're not guaranteed anymore to be variational. Okay, so I don't need a quantum computer to do that. But the problem is, is when you go, this is something that was actually known by uh, and proposed by Rod Bartlett, um, not in the factorized form, um, in a slightly different form, back when unitary coupled cluster made its debut in the, in the mid 80s. Um, and it was viewed as not being very good because if you try to go into the more strongly correlated regime, it starts to fail pretty quickly. Um, so what we're proposing is a hierarchical approach. We're going to separate into three categories, large angles, small angles, and negligible angles. The negligible angles, we're going to just set equal to zero and remove from our problem. We're not going to consider those terms at all. We're going to optimize the large angles exactly using the same kind of unitary coupled cluster calculation that I was showing you before using that exact operator identity. And then we're going to do a Taylor series expansion, not a Maclaurin series expansion, now a Taylor series expansion about this new um, the new angles given by the exact angles that I've already optimized. All the other angles are zero, but the exact angles are not. And so now to do that calculation, I now have to calculate the derivatives relative to this reference state, which has the unitary, the uh, UCC factors for the large angles applied to the hartree fock state. And this rapidly becomes a very complicated state. But it's easy for a quantum computer 
to generate this, especially if the number of UCC factors is not very large. It does require many measurements though, and that's really where the trade-off is. Every many body physics problem is hard, and our trade-off here is that uh, we have to uh, do many measurements in order to get good results. So how does it work? Here I'm showing you water, uh, the stretching of the bond in water, and uh, you probably don't remember, but the in the minimal basis, the correlation of energy of water was around um, minus 75 milli electron volts in these units. If I go to a better basis, like a double zeta basis, I think this is double zeta with polarization, you can see the correlation energy is now you know, in the 200 to 500 range. It's a huge difference. The minimal basis is really rather poor. But this is a problem that can be solved with uh, full CI. It's about 1.65 million determinants. Uh, if I just look at the singles and doubles, there's 2,240 determinants for singles and doubles. But this method that we're using, we have about 24 to 28 large angles. And the remaining 2,000 or so singles and doubles amplitudes are included in this virtual fashion by calculating the derivatives and doing the expansion about the point where those angles are zero. And you take a look at the accuracy that we get here. So couple cluster singles and doubles, it starts off pretty good, it's variational, and then we get to this point, it starts to fail, becomes non-variational, and pretty soon after this, it's gonna fail, <coughs> fail rather miserably. Our approach here, where we really are only putting in our calculation 20 UCC factors or so, as opposed to 2,000, we're treating all the rest virtually, we're nearly the same as coupled cluster for most of the way, but we don't become non-variational. We stay variational. And you know we have a relatively small energy difference here. Um, and this is really starting to get fairly strongly correlated at this kind of a bond stretch. All right, uh, I'm now gonna move into the second third of the talk uh, and talk a little bit about Green's function-based method. So, uh, well, I guess to conclude that, uh, which I should do before moving on to the next uh, method, I should say that, uh, you know, we're actively working on this problem. We're trying to improve it and understand better um, how to make more efficient this large number of measurements that you have to make. Um, so we're also thinking now about what are other techniques we can use to describe the molecule, especially when we get into a stage where time evolution is possible. And that motivates us thinking about Green's function-based methods. And this is work done predominantly with Dominika Zagid. <coughs> she has a technique called uh, self-energy embedding theory, or SEAT. And this is related to dynamical mean field theory, which I'm sure many people at uh, uh, BNL at Brookhaven are familiar with uh, dynamical mean field theory. But we're going to be talking about a slightly different variant of that, um, where we're going to be looking at calculating the Green's function on a quantum computer, but we're going to be doing it a little bit differently. What we want to do is we want to approximate the t equals zero Green's function of the molecule. And using the previous UCC approach, we know how to approximately get the ground state wave function. So we're gonna prepare that approximate ground state wave function on the quantum computer. And then we can use the Los Alamos algorithm, or it's sometimes now called the Hadamard test. Or I'll be talking about some more robust alternatives uh, later in the talk to calculate the Green's function. And then what we will do, that Green's function is gonna come out as a function of time at a discrete number of different data points at the time grid points that I evaluated the Green's function. We're then gonna use compressive sensing to separately fit the real and imaginary parts to sparse delta functions. And you can think of this as a simplified Lehman representation. And then we'll use Dyson's equation to determine the self-energy and extract the dynamical part of the self-energy. That means we remove the constant uh, contribution to the self-energy. And we'll use that to approximate the dynamical part of the self-energy of the molecule. And this is not run on a quantum computer, but this is looking at that same Foresight Hubbard model using just the doubles approximation, not including the quad, and calculating a Green's function. I think in this case, the U is equal to one or two. So it's a fairly weakly correlated system, but you can see that uh, the Green's function that you get from this approach by applying that UCC term onto the um, Hartree-Fock ground state and then 
doing time evolution and calculating uh, an expectation value using the Hadamard test uh, gives you pretty good results. You can't tell the difference between the real and the approximate uh, uh, Green's function. So the way this dynamical self-energy mapping works is the following, because we can't actually do time evolution for a uh, molecular Hamiltonian because it just has far too many terms to try to imagine trotterizing it and doing time evolution. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute a simple Green's function approximation for the molecular system, something like hartree fock or coupled cluster or MP2 or flex. And then we're going to determine a sparse Hubbard-like Hamiltonian that has the same low order moments of the Green's function. So it's approximating this molecular Green's function uh, reasonably accurately. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do exact time evolution of this Hubbard-like, very sparse Hamiltonian and compute its exact Green's function on the quantum computer. Then using the techniques I just mentioned with compressive sensing, we're going to extract the dynamical part of the self-energy and use that as an approximation to the dynamical part of the self-energy of the molecule and plug back into this Green's function, but now not using the approximate Green's function, using the exact dynamical Green's function of the ultra-sparse Hamiltonian that we believe approximates well the molecule. And then from that, any property of the molecule that you can get from the Green's function, including its energy, but you can get other things as well, would now be available to us. So we haven't gotten very far on this, so I'm going to just tell you, uh, stay tuned for more results as uh, we get further along uh, in that project uh, to see how, how we do with it. One of the things you might be concerned about is that uh, you might not believe that a sparse Hamiltonian can approximate accurately the uh, energies of the molecule. But remember, the molecule is weakly correlated. So most of the energy of the molecule is already coming from the Hartree-Fock. And we're not touching the Hartree-Fock. That is the, um, um, that's the initial basis that we're working in, plus the um, constant terms in the self-energy, all of that we're treating exactly, and those are all determined from the Hartree-Fock. So all of that, those contributions to the energy are getting put in exactly into the molecule. It's only the dynamical part of the self-energy, which includes the correlations, that we are approximating in this fashion. But by um, having a hierarchical scheme, which we have for determining what this ultra-sparse Hamiltonian is, making it less sparse by improving the accuracy, allows us to sort of interpolate and figure out how big does that Hamiltonian have to be in order to give us good accuracy for the final results for the molecule. So this is something that we can actually control in a reasonable fashion uh, when looking at doing calculations. Okay. Can I have a question? Mm -hmm. What is a rough, can you tell the rough error scaling of when you use this tool to spot some Hamiltonians when you look at the energy? Yeah, so um, I have to defer. I, I don't actually have a plot on the top of my hand that I can show you because if I did, I would have put it in, in the talk. So this is work yeah. that uh, Dominica has done, and she does have a preprint on the archive where she summarized these results in tables. Um, so you can go and take a look at, uh, it'll be a, uh, preprint from last year and it will have this DSEM, uh, in the title and she has a number of tables in there that you can look at. I was hoping to get a graphic, I was going to grab a graphical figure from that paper, but there is no figure in that paper. So I didn't have anything I could grab. Um, but it actually is pretty good. You know, it's not perfect, so when you're stretching the molecule, you're, you're going to start losing the ability to get into chemical accuracy. Um, but you can get uh, chemical accuracy, I think, fairly far uh, uh, in the molecule with this, with this technique. And, you know, the kind of point that uh, Dominica likes to make, and I certainly uh, believe in this as well, you know, it's going to be some time before we get to chemical accuracy on anything that's going to come out of a quantum computer. So... In order to start illustrating that we can do things that are sophisticated on a quantum computer, you know, it's okay to work with approximations that might not be at the gold standard of chemical accuracy to illustrate how these kinds of calculations can work, especially if we have a hierarchical scheme that allows us to improve 
it by uh, doing more complicated calculations. And, and this way of doing things does, you can imagine in the limit, I just include the full molecular Hamiltonian from the time evolution. And then of course, it's gonna give me the right self energy. So you can clearly see that um, there's a regime there where uh, you can tune your accuracy. So you should be able to, to achieve the accuracy that you desire in the calculation you're pursuing. And typically for Green's function based quantities that you might be extracting, the chemical accuracy might not be quite as steep. It's usually a bit steeper for the ground state than it is, say, for excited states and other things like that. Even with regular classical calculation, we don't determine excited state energies to the same level of accuracy typically as we can do ground state energies. Okay, I'm now going to move on to the third part uh, of the talk, which is going to be talking about dissipation. And I'm not familiar with the audience as to whether or not you're uh, familiar with um, uh, working with dissipative models. So if I'm going to quickly over some of this material, please uh, pause me and, and ask some questions. Um, I just want to point out there are many problems in chemistry that have dissipation. Um, one of the classic examples is this Fena Matthews Olsen complex, which I believe comes from uh, photo emission. Um, but it essentially comes from the fact that if you're going to do chemistry in a solvent, or if you're going to <coughs> worry about effective vibrations on what you're doing in your molecule, there are different places where dissipation can play a role. And one of the things that's very important to keep in mind is dissipative systems, especially those that have unique steady states, they're intrinsically stable um, because they have the steady state nature to them. And that makes them good prospects for quantum simulation on NISC machines. In many respects, they're robust and uh, you can create algorithms that are uh, self-error correcting, if you like, um, just intrinsically. They're robust error correcting or uh, error averse uh, algorithms. And I'm going to describe to you some of those uh, in the remainder of the talk. Um, I'm going to talk about two different examples. One of them is a chemistry example. I wasn't directly involved in this work, but my graduate student was. Um, this calculation is actually using the intrinsic dissipation in the IBM quantum computer as the dissipator for the quantum calculations. It's a pretty neat idea, and I'm going to at least sketch that for you. And then I'm going to show you a situation where we completely engineer the dissipation. We create a bath, and we look at solving the problem of the system interacting with the bath. We integrate out the bath, make a master equation. We put the master equation on the quantum computer, and we solve that master equation. And we can even get to the point where we can uh, extract Green's functions uh, on NISC machines. So we've already done this, and I'll show you some data for that, which is, is pretty exciting because if, you, if I can extract Green's functions on NISC machines, I can start to do something that's uh, interesting and exciting. So let me start by telling you a bit about what the quantum algorithms are that we're using here. So the way in which this works is uh, if I have a closed system, the time evolution of the density matrix is relatively simple. Uh, all operators just evolve by a commutator with a Hamiltonian. And so um, if it's a density matrix, I have to put that unitary time evolution operator, U of T, both on the left-hand side and a U dagger on the right-hand side, just because of the nature of what the density matrix operator looks like, because it's this sort of uh, butterfly of uh, bras and kets that are added together. Now, if we start off our system in a state that has some density matrix for the system, which is denoted rho s of zero, and we start the system off in some, the bath is started off in some pure state, then when I look at the time evolution and this U operator is acting on the whole system plus bath, I can separate it out into by uh, taking a uh, product with all of the different states of the bath and summing over them. This is now doing a partial trace over the environment or over the bath. I multiply it by bra and ket on the right and on the left, and I sum over i. And that is the way that I take a partial trace. And you might naively think, well, this is a number then. But this isn't a number because the U operator acts both on the environment and on the system. If I trace out the environment, this is an operator that acts on the system. 
And that operator has a name. It's called a Krauss operator. And this expression becomes the time evolution of the system density matrix is given by the sum over these different Krauss operators acting on the initial uh, density matrix of the system. And formally, this is an exact expression if I can work with the exact time evolution of system plus environment. Now, we typically don't know how to do that, so we instead move into a master equation approach for open quantum systems. And the master equation has a couple of different approximations to it. The first one is that the environment is much bigger than the system. So whatever the system is doing to the environment, we kind of say it's relatively weak and we can just approximate the environment by its density matrix without putting in any time dependence given by whatever the system is doing to the environment. Uh, the second thing is, is that we assume a Markov approximation, which says the environment has a negligible memory. And so the healing time for something in the environment is essentially instantaneous. And then we go into a, and we do a rotating wave approximation. That's called the secular approximation. And when you do that, you can reduce the evolution of the system into what's called a Lindblad a master equation in the Lindblad form. And the way that this looks is we have this uh, density matrix of the system, the time derivative of it. We have the dynamics of the system given by the Hamiltonian. And then we have these terms which are given in an approximate fashion. Um, this is an approximate representation of what those Krauss operators are. There's some rate, gamma i, and then there are jump operators and operators that provide no jumps. So these operators are called Lindblad operators, and this is the form of a Lindbladian that is representing the uh, interaction of an environment with a system, but we're doing all of our calculations on the system only because we've traced out the environment degrees of freedom. Okay, so the way in which you can implement this Limbladian on a quantum computer is via what is called a Krauss map. And the way in which this works is we have qubits that describe the environment. The, we're not actually describing the whole environment, which we can think of as being infinite in size. Instead, we just need ancilla that will describe the different effective degrees of freedom of the environment via those Krauss operators that are, or the Limbladian operators that we're choosing to represent in the dissipative process. So we don't have to have a Limbladian operator for every uh, possible operator that can be connected in the uh, environment space. We can actually work with just a subset of them. And so this ancilla bank is just needed for the subset of operators that we're actually doing the dynamics for. And the way in which the map works is we use C naught to map the environment onto the system. And then we use these select operators to apply the Krauss operators. And we use a different select operator with a different encoding on the ancilla bank for the different Krauss operators that we're applying. We then do an inverse of the map via these C naughts. And then here's where the uh, irreversibility enters into the simulation. We reset the ancilla to zero. So all of the entanglement that we got by entangling the system with the environment, and then it gets even more complicated when we do this mapping with the C naughts, all of that entanglement between the system and the environment gets destroyed when we do the measurement. And this is the way that we bring in the irreversibility uh, into the uh, uh, driven dissipative system. Maybe I will pause and just ask, are there any questions about this? What is the typical size of E? So I will show you some examples of what can be done on uh, conventional quantum computers. We typically are working with uh, one, two, three ancilla for current applications. Um, but in general, that number can be large. Okay, I see. And uh, you, you do the post-selection? There's no post-selection. No post-selection. So, so what no post-selection. You're just resetting the ancillas to zero. Oh, oh okay. There's no post-selection. We don't measure, we don't care what the ancilla values are. We just reset okay. them to zero. Okay, I see. 
And I'll illustrate you sort of in principle how that works when I'm talking here in this next slide about algorithmic cooling. So sorry, I, mm -hmm. I have also a question. The, what, sure thing. How do you, how do you decide the uh, cloud separator here? So for that, you have to, you know, there are a couple of different ways in which you can do that, but that's really where the challenge is in trying to figure out a problem that you can simulate. So the best way of doing it is you start from a bath and you um, uh, derive the Lindblad formula uh, from the bath using the different approximations. And then for each of those Lindbladian operators, you can construct a, a Krauss operator to carry out the quantum math. Um, I think this ancillary information such as the uh, like a temperature or pressure. Well, that's encoded in the map of the Krauss operators. The information about the temperature is actually in what the map is that uh, that takes place. It's encoded in, in that. Um, it's not like if I want to go to lower temperature, I need more ancilla or anything like that. It doesn't work that way. It's a fixed number of ancilla for whatever the system is that you're coupling to with the given maps that you're putting in. OK. OK. So let, let me, this, this slide might clarify a little bit of this. So let me, let me go through this slide. So this is a very, very simplistic view of algorithmic cooling. I have a system with two qubits and I have an environment with two qubits. And the environment has a large magnetic field and I'm putting these two qubits in the ground state in that magnetic field. And the system here is in a high energy state in that magnetic field. And what I do is I allow the system to entangle with the environment. And in the process of entangling, I might, get a spin flip where a, a, system uh, a system qubit flips to a low energy configuration and it does so by flipping a system qubit to a high energy configuration. And then the total energy of the system is conserved during this process. It's a Hamiltonian process. Um, but now if I reset the environment, I'm going to pull the energy out of B from the system because I'm resetting this down to a low energy state. And my system you can see now is at a lower energy than it was beginning because I pulled that energy out of the system. And this is sort of a very simple schematic way that you can think about you know, algorithmic cooling. And in many respects, you can think about what that reset is doing in the calculations. It's essentially um, pulling energy out of the system during the reset process. Okay, so algorithmic cooling can be uh, implemented in a similar kind of fashion. Here I'm actually representing the environment as qubits. I have my system, and then I have some interaction between the system and the environment. And then uh, I either will reset the environment or I will have some way of uh, uh, thermalizing the environment uh, in some fashion to uh, make sure that the interaction between the system and the environment is at, say, some fixed temperature. Okay, so let me give you some examples of how this works. Uh, there's a really nice example from spin chemistry. As I mentioned before, this was done by my graduate student when he was uh, um, uh, working at an apprenticeship at uh, IBM during his PhD. And uh, the way that this works is you have this complicated uh, bound radical pair. You zap it with light to break it up into two different radicals. And it does so from a singlet state. But now when you have these radicals sitting in solution, they're simply evolving. And the, the two spins are effectively independent from each other. They can interact with each other, but they're not required to stay in a singlet state. So they will periodically change from singlet to triplet and back again as they evolve. And it's a complex environment that they're evolving in. And then what you do is you recombine them, or they recombine themselves by flore uh, they recombine by themselves. If they're in the singlet state, they fluoresce. If they're in the triplet state, they do not. So the way the experiment works is you zap it with light to break up the radicals, and then you just observe the light that is fluorescing back as a function of time, and you plot the uh, intensity of that fluorescence as a function of time. And so we want to simulate this system. And it's a simple system because it's a spin system. And uh, this is just a setup for the system. There's a time evolution. And then we're going to, uh, you know, again, we have the mapping. And you have then the, um, um, uh, you uh, remove the mapping. And then you do this, do a measurement. 
This is the actual circuit that is used for the Krauss, applying the Krauss operators. And this is a circuit that is used for applying an intrinsic method. And I want to talk a little bit about the intrinsic method because what we're doing here is essentially we're applying these different entangling gates between the system and the ancilla, but we're also waiting long periods of time for these ancilla to decay from the one state to the zero state. And that intrinsic decay in the ancilla is what is providing the decoherence. There's no resets in this circuit. It's just using intrinsic decay in the quantum computer. And the reason why we break it up into these four different pieces is this is actually a spin echo sequence, which removes some of the errors that you generate in the quantum computer because you're running very long circuits. And what happens is the calibration, which isn't perfect, kind of gets out of whack when you run it for a very long circuit. But using a spin echo, you can get rid of the calibration errors. And there are two different models that were looked at here. One of them was a simpler model molecule. Again, I can't tell you exactly what the molecule is. If you want to learn those details, you need to go to the preprint. Um, but this is the simple molecule and the quantum computer results. Here, it was run in two different ways, one with the Krauss map and one with the intrinsic decoherence. So I believe the one with the Krauss map is just pulling out this behavior of the exponential decay. And then the one with the intrinsic decoherence actually has extra oscillatory behavior in it. Um, and then this is a more complicated molecule, and this is actual experimental data that they're comparing to. And the theory is actually fairly simple for this, so it can be calculated exactly. And the red dots are what comes out of the quantum computer after you've done your processing and so forth. And you can see it's really quite good. In fact, the experimental data starts to get poor out here at long times because there just isn't very much signal coming out. Um, but the quantum computer data is still, you know, sticking with the theory incredibly well. Um, so this is a nice, simple example of a dissipative chemis chemical system that can be put on a quantum computer. And the last example I'm going to show you is of uh, two different um, approximations that are actually closer to solid state than quantum chemistry, unless you're really interested in things like uh, hydrogen chains or hydrogen rings. And it's a driven dissipative Hubbard model. And what we have here is we have sites and the electrons can hop from site to site, but this hopping has a complex uh, amplitude to it because of the pyrrole substitution. We're applying a constant electric field that gives a complex phase to the hopping. Um, again, when the two electrons are on the same site, they feel an interaction U, but now each site is attached to a semi-infinite bath, a linear line semi-infinite with a hybridization or a hopping V to the bath. And in the non-interacting limit, when U is equal to zero, this is the circuit for the driven dissipative system. It's a very simple circuit, requires just one ancilla, and we can run this on a quantum computer. The circuit actually can be simplified a little bit uh, from the one that is given here because uh, we're actually only interested in the diagonal elements for the calculations we're doing initially uh, in this circuit. And here's what we got off the quantum computer. And I want, for those of you who've been running on NISC machines, this is really quite remarkable data. We ran a thousand trotter steps. So most time evolution on current NISC machines, you're lucky if you get three or four trotter steps before everything goes to pot. In the driven dissipative system, we can run a thousand trotter steps. And you can see the amplitude of the oscillations in this driven dissipative system are about the same at a thousand steps as they were out here initially. <coughs> and to show that we actually have good data, we take this data, we look at it over a single period after the transients have died off. There's a transient region out here at short times. We average all of the non-transient data. And what we do is the reset on the IBM machine is not perfect. So we do the reset once, twice, three, and four times. And then we scale that to the zero reset time limit. And you might think, you know, why just focus on the resets? Well, the reset part of the calculation is something like three to four times longer than the actual uh, quantum part of the calculation. So actually, the, the, essentially, the time of the calculation is determined by the resets. So we scale to the zero reset time limit, and that is given by this dashed curve here. 
And then as we have to do with pretty much all the quantum calculations because of noise and other things like that, we have to scale our data to compare it with the exact results. And if I scale this data, I then get the orange dots. And you can see the orange dots are essentially exactly on top of the black line, which is the exact results for this trotterized circuit. So the quantum NISC machines can handle driven dissipative systems essentially exactly, at least in this limit where they're non-interactive. We can use the density matrix that we generated to actually calculate the DC current that is appearing in the system. And that's shown for you here. Red is the ideal circuit. Blue is the actual processed quantum qu computer data. The Lindblad calculation are the black dots, okay, which is slightly different from the ideal circuit because the circuit is trotterized. And you can see that the data, it's working remarkably well. Um, this, we took this out, uh, I believe, 300 trotter steps to get to the DC limit, which we don't quite get there for some of the calculations. Um, and that is giving rise to a little bit of the oscillations that you're seeing in the data. Okay, <coughs> we can also solve it in the atomic limit. So in the non-interacting limit, it really is a non-interacting system when u equals zero. But the atomic limit is interacting, even with no hopping. But the electric field is not playing any role anymore because the electric field was being determined entirely from the hopping. But now we can add on a magnetic field and split the levels. So in the atomic limit, we have four states, no electrons, a spin up, a spin down, and both an up and a down. And what we do is we're going to now create a um, thermal state using an algorithmic cooling type of approach. If you look at these four different states, these are all the different kinds of jump operators that you can have that connect the different states. But we can actually work with a subset of them. And in fact, this is even too much. We can actually reduce ourselves just to a ring that connects all of the different states. And all of the thermal properties are determined by what the values are that we give for these different gamma parameters. And in order to make them thermal, this is what we have to put in to generate a thermal state at a temperature given by one over beta. And this is the circuit. It's a more complicated circuit. We have to have two ancilla when we're running this circuit. And uh, it has these multiple controlled rotations as we have to have with these kinds of Krauss operators. We have to reset our ancilla bank at each step. And what we see is that initially, the circuit is not perfect. Compare the blue to the red. The transients are not coming out perfect. This is looking at the populations of the different states, the up state, the down state, the empty state, and the doubly occupied state. But we are properly getting the thermal state in the steady state limit. And we've done tomography to verify that our density matrix is diagonal as well. So this works as well for the atomic limit, which is a st truly strongly correlated regime. Um, and I'm going to end the talk. If I've got maybe two, three minutes left, I can see that I'm coming up right toward the end of the talk. Um, should I go on and tell you about Green's functions or just end here? Um, I don't know what, what do people uh, want. So we're running, yeah, we ran out of time. Uh, but I don't know if people want to have any questions. Uh, no, but I think I think uh, I want him to finish. I, it's really only about three minutes. So I, I really I yeah, promise yeah, I won't sure. take you I won't take you too long. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so this is the standard way that you calculate a a green a correlation function like this using what's called the Hadamard test. You require one ancilla. You apply a Hadamard on the ancilla, a controlled operation to apply the a. You then do time evolution, a controlled operation to apply the B, and then you measure the ancilla, both the X and the Y. So I'll just take you through the steps. You start off in a product state, Hadamard on the ancilla, controlled operation to create an entangled state, time evolution, second controlled operation. And now when you do a measurement, the measurement involves the overlap of these two states because I'm measuring an off diagonal element of the ancilla. And you can see that this is B of T with A. So that's how you measure a two-particle correlation function.
But there's a problem with this, which is that the ancilla sits here during the time evolution. And if you have any kind of decoherence in your system, and this is particularly bad for the superconductor-based machines, the decoherence can be significant and greatly erode the signal that you get. And you typically can't go very far in time before you just get garbage. There's a robust alternative to this. One of them is that you can rotate the um, decoherence from being off diagonal to diagonal, and then there are techniques you can use to preserve the diagonal part of the ancilla during the time evolution. Then you rotate back to making it off diagonal and then do your measurement. But there's also a technique where you essentially measure the ancilla after you've entangled it. And then at the end, you measure the system. And you need to know what the result of this measurement was for the ancilla. But by um, essentially accumulating the results for your measurement of the system based on what the measurement of the ancilla was, you can do this. And this has no decoherence to it whatsoever. So we applied this on the Honeywell machine. And this is for the non-interacting system in the field calculating its Green's function. And this is the real part and the imaginary part. Uh, minus the imaginary part as functions of time. The solid lines are what the exact calculation are. The dashed lines are what you would expect with some noise and decoherence in the system. And the symbols are the actual data that came out. We believe the coherence time of the system is somewhere in this sort of 2025 range. But because this driven dissipative system is effectively a contractive map, it can actually calculate the Green's function beyond the coherence time of the NISC machine, which is pretty remarkable, as you can see here. It's really not showing any loss in the quality of the calculation beyond the coherence time. So that is uh, our last results. We need to extend this to include interactions. This is a really hard thing to do, and we're actively working on this problem. If we can do this, I believe even NISC machines can do interesting results that are very difficult to do on classical machines because we don't know how to solve driven dissipative problems on classical machines very efficiently. And that's all that I have. I'll just flash up the people who are involved in this work and uh, be happy to answer any questions that, uh, uh, that you might have. Thank you, James. Uh, any questions? So, so I, I have a very basic question. So, this resetting is equivalent to just doing non-unitary? It is a non-unitary uh, operation. So the way that resets are done on the IBM machine is they measure the qubit that you want to reset. And if it's in the one state, they apply a, they apply a sigma x to it to bring it to a zero state. If it's in the zero state, they do nothing. And if you want to repeat that, they just repeat it. They then, after you've made that decision, you measure it again. And then you do it a third time, and then you do it a fourth time. And the hope is by the time you've done it some number of times, you really have reset. But I believe the time for running is something like 150 microseconds. Mm -hmm. So it's long for one reset. So it's long. And uh, um, most of the decoherence that you're getting in your system for the remaining part of the system, which is just sitting there while you're doing the reset, uh, is coming about because it's just sitting and waiting. And the ones are decaying to zeros and so forth during that time. Now on the Honeywell, on the ion trap machines, what they do is they do optical pumping. So they just pump the system into the zero state. Mm -hmm. So in the IBM system, this is, is it fair to say this is measurement involved? Yes, so like if you want to know what like the ancilla, if you want to know what the ancilla is, uh, they, they are doing a measurement. So you can, you can learn what the value of the ancilla was for the reset. Yes. But not exactly. Like a post selection. I mean, I, I, I want to know what, what is so the, you so if 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 your algorithm requires just a reset, 
you don't need to be told what the result of the measurement was. You just need to know that the qubit was reset. That's the way our algorithm works. But if your algorithm requires you to know what the ancilla was, either for post-selection or just for processing, like what happens with our robust Green's function algorithm, um, then you have that data available for you and you can use mm -hmm. it in your post-processing to get the answer. So what about the, in your example, this is you are resetting the you know, environment part, right? And the system part is still, you know, before the reset, you have entanglement between environment and the system. That's right. The entanglement is killed by the reset. And so I'm going from, if I had a pure state between the uh, system and the ancilla, now I have a partially mixed state. Okay, okay. But so that's what dissipation does. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So it's effectively taking trace. You can oh. think of it that way, yeah. Okay. Um, it is, but that's what dissipation does. It it takes pure right, states right. And, and moves them into mixed states. So oh. it's doing exactly what you want the dissipation to do. I see. Very, very interesting. And the fact that the system has kind of contracting stable ground state makes your simulation bit longer. Well, the, the way that I would describe it is that if you have, it's kind of like error correction. We know for error correction to work, a qubit has to have high enough fidelity. And depending upon what your error correction algorithm is, there's a known fidelity target that your qubits have to hit. If they don't have that fidelity, they cannot be error corrected. So there's a threshold before you can actually run error correction. It's the same thing with these driven dissipative systems. The, uh, there's a lot of analogy with error correction with, with what's going on here. Mm -hmm. I have to be able to run that single trotter step with a high enough fidelity that the contractive nature of the map will be properly represented. If I don't have high enough fidelity with a single trotter step, I can't I can't run it. And uh, uh, we, when, when we just encoded the Hubbard atom calculation, we had 46 C knots in a single trotter step. And that was too much. It was not high enough fidelity. We could not get it to properly run a dissipative map. But when we made the circuit much more efficient and we got down to, I believe, something like 20 C knots. I think we reduced it by more than a factor of two. That had high enough accuracy at each trotter step that we could run it. But you could see that really only kicked in when we got to the steady state because the initial transients were not quite as accurate. It was only when we got really to the full contractive nature. So the contractive nature takes some time to kick in. When we got there in the steady state, then it was approaching the right steady state. Wow, very interesting. So there is kind of like a threshold for these kinds of calculations on current machines. Your single trotter step cannot be too complicated or it won't work. Thank you, thank you. So this is published? Uh, we have a preprint on, uh, on that. The Green's function work has not been published yet. We're writing that up, but the uh, dissipative map uh, all of that data is available on a preprint right now. Okay, and the title has a dissipative map. Uh, yeah, something like uh, driven dissipative systems uh, driven. or something like Thank that. Thank you very much. Yeah, you just look for my name. I'm a I'm a co-author. Okay, great. Thank you, Jim. Uh, any other questions? Uh, if there's not any other, I, I do have so. About we could do part. informal session. Maybe? Yeah, maybe that'd be that'd be good. Yeah, we can we can close the formal now, and and we can if Jim is okay with it, we can ask a few more questions. Sure.